Hello and welcome to the Practical Animal Channel, which is for you if you want to know what it takes to work with animals. My next guest is Nick Garbett. Nick went to Mauritius in 1991 for two years to work on an endangered species conservation project to save the Mauritius kestrel from extinction. From there he went to Madagascar and developed a special interest in the fauna of that island. He subsequently developed a career as an author and as a wildlife photographer and he joins me now to tell me how he did it. Nick Garbutt, welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Thank you John, good to be here. Please can you describe your career from the start to today? My career was never planned. All I knew was I wanted to do zoology at university and I wanted to make a living as a zoologist. So after I graduated, I did the obvious thing and started doing research, which I did for a couple of years. And I wanted to do a PhD, but that didn't happen. And then got the job in Mauritius, um, which I did for two years, um, like yourself. But that got me into the conservation side of things. And at the time, I then really thought that's what I wanted to do and spend or develop a career within the conservation sphere. And as you've just alluded to, while I was working in Mauritius, I really started to enhance my interest in what was going on in Madagascar. And I tried to get work after I left Mauritius within the conservation community in Madagascar. Um, but sadly, it never happened. And part of the reason was my own fault because I, I wasn't a fluent French speaker and that really held me back in my opportunities to potentially get work there. But uh, I nonetheless visited Madagascar under my own steam um, on two occasions. I was taking pictures. And as a consequence of that, I started doing work for magazines um, and got a couple of magazine articles published using my own photos. And that really sort of kickstarted the notion that I could possibly do something career-wise within photography and writing. Um, didn't happen straight away. Uh, and I moved sideways into working in wildlife tourism, and leading, organizing and leading wildlife tours initially to Madagascar, which was really an excuse to get me back to Madagascar. Um, so all of that started to develop and then I worked for a couple of years for a wildlife travel company. And then I think in 96, decided to go it alone and become uh, work freelance, developing the career in photography and writing for magazines, writing my own books, and in tandem doing wildlife tourism. So organizing wildlife photography or then wildlife watching safaris, initially to Madagascar, other parts of the world that are quite familiar, East Africa, but more latterly, over the last 10 years, I've really diversified and now do wildlife photography trips all over the world. Nick, what has been your proudest moment? I'd have to probably give you two. The first book that I authored entirely on my own, which was the first edition of Mammals of Madagascar in 1999. And then the following year, I was... Um, one of the category winners in one of the prestigious categories in Wildlife Photography of the Year, the Gerald Dole Endangered Species um, Award um, in 2000. Nick, what's your guiltiest pleasure at work? It's making use of the internet. It's making use of the BBC Sport website when I'm travelling. Nick, you're an author, wildlife photographer, and let's face it, expert on the fauna of Madagascar reptiles, lemurs. What are the skills, experiences and personal qualities that have been key to your success as an author and wildlife photographer? Dogged persistence and a tough skin and the conviction to follow what I wanted to do and not give up. Um, certainly earlier on in my career when I was really driven um, in my late 20s, 30s, where I, into my early 40s, really, you know, I just said I wanted to do well at what I'd chosen to do. Other people that do what I do think Nick does a bloody good job when he 
puts his mind to it. That was what I was aiming for. That was what I aspired to. That drove me on and the persistence to try and make sure that happened. Certainly when I've been writing a book, I've always set off with the aim of making it as perfect as I could possibly be, not cut any corners. I'm not saying they are perfect because they're not, but at least you set off with that aim and you do your absolute utmost to make sure that whatever you produce is 101% the best you could have done at that time. Nick, what people, meetings or books have most influenced your thinking? The Blind Watchmaker by Richard Dawkins, followed by several other of Richard Dawkins's books on evolution, natural selection, etc., which has so influenced my way of thinking. Um, more broadly, his thoughts on rationality and thinking logically. And as far as people are concerned, I suppose I'd pick a couple of photographers who were very influential when I first started in terms of me looking at their work and going, wow, I wish I could do that. And they were um, Jim Brandenburg and Franz Lanting. And when I was first starting out in the late 80s, taking photographs and trying to get my work published, I'd always look at their images and go, I wish I could take pictures as good as that. Nick, what is your view of the profession of wildlife photography today? I think wildlife, the wildlife photos that are taken now are probably the best and most innovative that's ever been taken. That's partly because technology has helped um, get access to and take images in a far more innovative way. There are more people doing it, so competition is greater. And as the opportunities and um, equipment and technology has expanded, so the imagination of photographers to come up with new ideas has broadened. So it's incredibly difficult now to reach the top of the pile, far more so than when I first started. I mean, a simple indication of that is if you look at the Wildlife Photography of the Year competition, when I first had success in it, there were perhaps 17, 18, 19,000 entries per year. There's two and a half times that now. Um, so it's a huge increase. And that's reflecting the number of people who simply have access to a camera. Equally importantly, have access to travel, which is until the last two years has never been easier. Um, so that's just raised the bar in any number of ways. And the way technology has advanced has just made things, the potential for more and more innovation. So every time you look at images, new images now, you see things from a different perspective, in a different light, in a different way. And I'm always looking at the work of other contemporaries um, to see what they're doing and just to get ideas and go, God, you know, I never thought of that. I never thought of doing that. And just to think, well, next time I'm in that situation, I can have a go at something not dissimilar because that's something I'd not thought of. So that level of innovation and competition has obviously made it very healthy. I think there are going to be lots of changes in the future. Obviously, the fundamental change since I started is the advent of digital photography replacing film and that with it has brought all sorts of possibilities and options. And that continuum is going to carry on and the technology will become more and more um, sophisticated to allow images to be, even more spectacular images to be achieved. I think one fundamental that will happen in the not too distant future is that effectively still photography and video photography will merge. We're virtually at the cusp now where cameras take still images at a rate that is nearly, if not the same as video is recorded, i.e. 25, 30 frames a second. And so I think at some point in the future, that gap will cease to be and they'll merge and you'll effectively take video and then just extract the stills you want from it. 
rather than say I'm going to either take video pictures or still pictures. And you've already touched on it, Nick, but 10 years from now, where do you see wildlife photography going? Well, again, the, the technical innovation will just take it to levels that I suspect at the moment we could barely conceive. As digital photography has developed, one of the slightly contradictory aspects has been that cameras have actually got bigger. Um, so physically, the kit has become larger and more cumbersome and weighty. So if I look at my old cameras, I could do now. You look at an old film camera, and it's that big, whereas a modern modern digital camera is. I mean, this is an old film camera, but it's the same size as a modern digital, whereas an old film camera was. And so there's a big size difference. Um, but I think one of the things that will happen with digital technology is that somehow they'll manage to start to miniaturize that. That's already started to happen. This is all, I use 35 millimeter photography. There's um, kit. There's very much a move towards using micro four thirds, which is four thirds the size um, of a regular sensor. So cameras have become smaller, lenses have become smaller, etc. And I think as technology advances, there'll be the potential to make cameras so much smaller in the way that you, you can use a, a GoPro now, which is you know, the size of a matchbox virtually, and still get incredibly good quality images on that. And therefore, if cameras get even smaller, the technological, the possibilities for where you could put cameras and conceal cameras to get images. You know, we're already at the stage with film where cameras can be attached to an animal to get perspectives. Now you could start to do that with still cameras if they become really small. So I, I think all of those things will happen in the not too distant future. Nick, what's the rarest species you've worked with? it would have to be Sumatran rhinos, which I've never seen genuinely in the wild. I've seen them in semi-captivity in Sumatra, um, but there are now probably fewer than 100 left, certainly in the wild, which given that 150 years ago, there were thousands of them is an incredibly sobering thought. You and I worked years ago with the incredibly rare Mauritius kestrel, at least it was incredibly rare then, less so now because the conservation project that you and I worked on has been very successful and the numbers have bounced back still in the mid hundreds I suspect but that's probably all there ever was on Mauritius. I've certainly seen lemurs certain lemur species in Madagascar that there are probably fewer than four or five hundred uh, left of a particular species and they they have an entire world range that's barely bigger than you know, a few football pitches. I mean, it's tiny, some of the, the world ranges of some of the rare species there. Nick, what is your best lemur fact, please? There are currently, depending on what taxonomy you follow, somewhere in the region of 106 recognized species of lemur. Um, I think one of the most amazing facts is that they are all derived from a single common ancestor. If you go back probably 55 million years, um, a single lemur-like primate, proto-primate ancestor rafted from East Africa inadvertently, didn't mean to, just happened to be on a floating mat of vegetation and got washed up on Madagascar. And obviously there had to be two individuals or a pregnant female. Um, but the consequence of that one event has led to um, a speciation, uh, an explosion, an evolutionary sort of explosion in Madagascar that now we see 106 species. And we already know that at least 17 or 18 species are extinct some of which there are the size of mountain gorillas. So you have a radiation from a single common ancestor that led to 
some species being the size of mountain gorillas, i.e. weighing 200 kilos, and other species being as small as to fit into an egg cup and weighing 25 grams. Madame Berth's mouse lemur, which is still alive today, is the world's smallest primate, and it weighs 25 to 30 grams. So, you know, would sit comfortably just in the cup of my hand like that. And as a single radiation from a single common ancestor, that's, I find that pretty mind blowing. Nick, what advice can you give somebody watching this who wants to replicate your career, become a wildlife author, become a wildlife photographer? How can somebody do that? That certainly is a tough question to answer, certainly to answer succinctly. Um, the first thing I would say is I'm, I'd be pretty scared trying to do it now as it was scary when I started 30 years ago. Um, it would be even more scary now because I think it's much harder now. It, it seemed very hard when I started, but it's even harder now because there's so much more competition. And crucially, it's far harder to earn worthwhile sums of money from selling images because the markets are saturated because there are so many digital images now out in the marketplace. The returns that are achievable from selling images has dramatically reduced. I earn far less purely from photo sales now as I did 15, 20 years ago. Um, so I've had to diversify and I make ordinarily a far greater proportion of my income from organizing my photo workshops and photo safaris around the world than I do from photo sales or book sales, etc. So I think if I had to give one piece of advice to anyone wanting to start, it would be don't put all your eggs in one basket. Make sure you've got other avenues that can earn money and you have to just try and develop your career in photography piecemeal bit by bit but don't think you are going to be able to become a wildlife photographer and instantly earn a living it's just not going to happen you've got to find ways to earn have several income streams now i've managed to do it with all of them related to wildlife writing photography organizing trips and safaris and workshops and obviously giving photography tuition but that's taken quite a while to build up so i think anybody starting out has to be realistic that it's not going to happen overnight they've got to be persistent and dogged and they've got to think of certainly several different streams through which they might generate income it's not all all going to come solely from photo sales because the, the money just isn't there these days how did COVID affect things, Nick? For the last two years, I've not done any foreign trips since March last year. So we're now, whatever that is, 20 months, 19 months of no foreign trips, when ordinarily I'd be traveling abroad every month somewhere. Um, so that has massively impacted my business personally, and I've had to diversify. Uh, in that I've gone back to doing a lot more writing. I've been working on a book, um, which hasn't earned me very much money, but I've been very fortunate because as a self-employed person, I was able to qualify for government assistance. But I know it's affected the broader wildlife business in any number of ways. I mean, I, think that I know, for instance, several of the series, the BBC series, Natural History Unit series, were compromised because they weren't able to go and film. So they weren't able to finish off series. Shoots that had been planned had to be cancelled. And I know some series that were planned at being, say, four programmes were suddenly down to three programmes or three programmes were down to two because they didn't have the content to make them as big and expansive as they'd hoped. Um, and that knock-on effect will last for some time because, of course, some of those filming trips are only just restarting. Um, so I think there'll be a sort of lag knock on effect because people weren't able to travel as much. And therefore they've had to concentrate on doing things much closer to home. 
I certainly know I have. You know, I've done far more trips in the last 18 months in the UK than I've done in the previous 10 years. Is it a big leap, Nick, of mindset and skill set going from being a wildlife photographer to being a wildlife filmmaker? I think the skills are quite different and the way you visualize something in front of you is quite different and there are very few people who have successfully managed to simultaneously be good filmmakers and take good stills you've got to concentrate on one or the other to do them really well and I think the ways of viewing things are quite different I visualize everything through a rectangle you know a two three by two rectangle that is a the viewfinder of a camera and I'm always in looking at scenes and imagining how it would look in that rectangle whereas obviously someone taking film is seeing it in a very different way and seeing a piece of action from start to finish whatever that may be and how that can link together with something else so uh, they are certainly different skills obviously they can be complementary but I don't think being good at one necessarily automatically means you'd be good at another. Nick, is there anything that you'd like to add? Well, if anyone else wants to do this, I would heartily recommend it. Um, you've just got to be realistic. You know, I, I've enjoyed pretty much every minute of what I've done as a career. I wouldn't want to change it. Um, I'm bloody lucky to have been able to do what I do and certainly make a living doing what I love doing. Um, make a living traveling traveling the world watching wildlife you know being paid to go and see snow leopards how good is that um so i think it's fantastic and anyone that wants to follow that you know, be passionate about it be passionate about the natural world and especially be passionate about the conservation of the natural world reducing our necessity necessity to consume resources etc it's all part of that bigger picture and if anyone can get enthusi enthusiastic about that and take that to heart, then there's a chance that the world will be, if not a worse place, but no worse and hopefully a better place in the future. But um, yeah, I've, I've loved every moment of what I've done and I certainly can intend continuing doing it for as long as my body allows me to do it. <laughs> Nick Garbutt, wildlife author and wildlife photographer. Thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure. This is the Practical Animal Interview.